Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you all very much for being here. My name is Russell Shorto. I'm the director of the John Adams Institute, which is an independent American culture center based here in Amsterdam. It's, it started in 1987. Next year will be our 25th anniversary, so look for some special events that we'll be planning to uh, celebrate that. This is our last event of the year, of, of 2011, and when we are planning events, mainly we do it simply uh, by thinking about what authors, what speakers we would like to hear from, whose books we're reading, what we think is important. That is to say, we don't so much try worry about balancing uh, the list, and it's only after, uh, that is to say today, I actually looked over the, the year uh, to see what what it consisted of, and I, um, just for the heck of it, I thought I would share with you what I came up with. We had uh, diff two different times of the year. We had Robert Kaplan and Francis Fukuyama, who are both, I guess you would call them global thinkers, who think about, in big terms, about history and geography and looking at what is going on as, as sort of uh, pieces in a, in a giant game, which is, I think, one thing that we're trying to do uh, these days, trying to figure things out on a large scale. We, at three different times, had Nicholas Carr, James Glick, and Joshua Four with books that were all about knowledge and information and how it is stored. And in the case of Joshua Four, his book is about memory and what happens when we download so much of our information from our brains to, uh, to other sources and what happens to our brains, which is, I think, also a topic on our minds. We had two books that in very different ways were about migration. Isabel Wilkerson with her lovely book, The Warmth of Other Suns, about the migration of black Americans from the southern part of the US to other parts. And Charles C. Mann, his book 1493, uh, about the migration of species around the world uh, in the wake of Christopher Columbus's voyage. And then we had a few events that I uh, couldn't really linked together. Uh, Stephen Knifey and Gregory White Smith there with their large and very impressive biography of Vincent van Gogh. Paul Theroux, the travel writer who uh, just had wonderful tales and wisdom. And Marvin Hamlish for something completely different, the, uh, the maestro of Broadway and Hollywood. What occurred to me is we only had two novelists this year, which is really uh, out of the ordinary for us. We had Lawrence Hill with the Book of Negroes, and tonight, of course, we have Jeffrey Eugenides. We will uh, commence rectifying that, uh, that soon. Jeffrey Eugenides is a literary hero of mine. The great uh, thing about this job is that you get to uh, meet and interact, however briefly, with people who you have read and admired for a long time. So I'm uh, delighted and uh, honored to have him here uh, for the second time, as it happens. He w did a John Adams event in 2002 when Middlesex came out. Um, the, the way these uh, events work, uh, he will uh, read a passage from the book and then we'll, we will have a moderated discussion and questions uh, from all of you. Our moderator tonight is Tim Overdeek from NOS News. He has been the deputy editor, London correspondent, and Washington correspondent. He is also the author recently of a beautiful book about his late wife called Tranen van Liefde, Tears of Love. He's now the Radio One Journal uh, presenter. He has moderated several John Adams events, and in thinking about this topic and this book in particular, I thought that it was a presented a slight challenge because if those of you who haven't read it, uh, it deals to some extent, I mean, it's very readable, but it deals with, uh, to some extent with um, semiotics, uh, postmodern uh, literary theory, Roland Barthes, and um, Derrida, and, and so we wanted someone who could, you know, if need be, grapple with these issues. And since uh, Tim grappled so fine, in such a, a fine manner with uh, David Sedaris when he was here, I figured if he could handle David Sedaris, he could handle Derrida. So please welcome our moderator, Tim Overdeek. Jeffrey Eugenides just asked, like, shall I go for the 20 or the 30 minute uh, reading? 
And I'm going to cut my introduction in half so you can do the 30 minute reading. I'm sure that everybody would agree to that. Um, last, uh, last Friday, I had gotten to page 298 in the marriage plot. Mitchell, one of the characters, is walking in the streets of Calcutta. And then this sentence Policeman directing traffic as expressive as Toscanini. I stopped reading right there, walked over to my study, opened up my laptop, went onto YouTube, searched for Toscanini, and for the next five minutes, I was enjoying, in black and white, Beethoven's Symphony No. 5, first movement, performed by the NBC Symphony Orchestra in Carnegie Hall on March 22nd, 1952. Conductor Arturo Toscanini, waving his arms like policemen in the busy streets of Calcutta. Jeffrey Eugenius, thank you very much for enriching my life right there for five minutes on page 298. It happened more often. I'm not sure if you experienced the same thing when I was reading The Marriage Plot, that I just had to stop reading and think about what the writer means when he is describing people, trying to visualize this person, which as a reader can also be very distracting. For example, Madeline's, quote, mellow voice cousin named Dotes, wearing tartan pants, married to Dinky, a frosted blonde with late de Koning teeth, de Koning, Willem de Koning. And yes, I went again over to my bookshelf, grabbing this massive de Koning biography to do some dental research. <laughs> and how about the character with the coltish legs? The other with B-52's hair. Somebody with a poofy Jean-Luc Ponty hairdo. And the other person with a depressed head like a chandelier. And again, Madeline herself, and I had trouble visualizing this one. I'm going to ask uh, Jeffrey to explain that one later on. Madeline, quote, as a young woman with pale, quiet, Episcopalian breasts, end quote. You get the picture? I didn't. Marvelous little literary treasures. At the same time, I was quite, well, just a bit now, I was quite intimidated by the marriage plot. Goodness, all these references to authors Writers, philosophers, poets, their works, either epic or obscure. On average, almost one subtle reference on every page. I started jotting down the names, but lost count. Too many of them, and what's the point? We're dealing with a writer who was a literature professor at Princeton University, teaching creative writing at the Lewis Center for the Arts. What do you expect? According to Princeton's website, which I checked yesterday, Professor Eugenides is on leave until September 2011. So we might consider ourselves lucky that he is playing hooky to be here with us tonight. Jeffrey Eugenides, born in 1960 in Detroit, Michigan, is of Greek and Irish descent. He studied at Brown University, which happens to be the college where the three main characters, Leonard, Madeline, and Mitchell graduate. That year is 1982, which was fun for me in my 40s replaying songs like Tainted Love, which was stuck in my head for days. Thank you for that too. Joe Jackson, writing on a typewriter, no emails, no cell phones, traveler checks when going abroad, maybe say historical novel. Eugenides himself went on to earn his master's in creative writing from Stanford University. He lived in Berlin for five years, I learned tonight, and now resides in Princeton, New Jersey with his wife and daughter. Three books he wrote. The Virgin Suicides, published in 1993. Middlesex, 2002, and now this one. Long time it took to start and finish a novel, nine years in between each one of them. I'm sure he will explain later about his maybe particular writing struggles or maybe just his deliberate approach by taking your time. The long wait for us as readers was definitely worth it. For him as well, considering the Pulitzer Prize he received for Middlesex, the Virgin Suicides being made into a movie written and directed by Sofia Coppola. Huwelijk, we were discussing that. Huwelijk, the Dutch title for the marriage plot. Maybe we should have a poll, like better title in Dutch. Has been, the Dutch title for the marriage plot has been widely received as an utter masterwork. It's been on the New York Times bestseller list for eight weeks now. If you want to know, it was second at some point, And now I checked this morning, number 13 on that list. But who cares about those numbers? Who cares about the millions of copies he sold in tens of languages? As far as I'm concerned, this is just a kick-ass book. 
An honest disclaimer on beforehand on my part, Russell was setting the bar a little too high there. Um, the stuff about semiotics, the study of symbols and signs, the underlining structure of meanings in texts, I confess I don't know. <laughs> I don't really get it. We're going to ask, he's going to explain to us, and for better or worse, tonight we will learn everything about the importance of being earnest about semiotics. Most important reference to a literary work in the marriage plot is A Lover's Discourse, The Taal der Verliefde by Roland Barthes, the French philosopher, literary critic, and yes, semiotician. The beauty of this book is a love story, a true love story, a story that defies the traditional expectations of love, of relationships, of marriage, while at the same time being very aware of those traditional expectations. Derived from stories like those written by Jane Austen, Think Sense and Sensibility, Henry James's Portrait of a Lady. And then there's the marriage plot, a romantic triangle among three college students. Madeline is an ambitious English major studying semiotics. Mitchell is a religious scholar from Detroit who travels to India to work with Mother Teresa. And Leonard is a brilliant philosophy student and a manic depressive. Leonard loves Madeline, Madeline loves Leonard, Mitchell loves Madeline, they collide, they complement. It all works out in the end by not working out. It was hard to put away this book, just like it was so great earlier this week while preparing for this evening, to reread The Virgin Suicides, to walk down that suicidal path with, I'm sure you all know them, Cecilia, then Therese, Bonnie, and Lux, and in the end, Mary the fifth and last sister to end her young life. I'm annoyed for not having found the time to read Middlesex. I will do it next week when I go on vacation. But hey, it doesn't matter when you have the great privilege to introduce to you the author of these three wonderful books, which hopefully, at least, uh, with at least hopefully three more to come in, let's say, the next 25 years. For now, let's start with the next hour. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Jeffrey Eugenides. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Russell. It's great to be here. I just got here this morning. I'm really happy to be in Amsterdam. It's one of my favorite cities. Um, I see that he handled Sedaris. Now he's handling me. I guess he's in charge of all the Greeks um, who, who come through town. You never know what we might get up to. Um, and I, I'm, I'm glad that I enriched your life during the, the period you put down my book to look at YouTube. That's, um, that's always Anything. what my goal is. Um, I, d does anyone have the, t the ticket for tonight? I, I, I was given a ticket in my hotel room um, with a picture of me on it and little... And I just wanted you to know that um, that photo makes me look very conceited and um, my daughter thought I should never use it somehow just so that so you know I didn't choose, I didn't choose to look that conceited. And I, I was reading also the um, description. I think at the beginning was Jeffrey Eugenides is one of the greatest living American novelists. That sounded pretty good to me. And then the next sentence was, though this may not be apparent. <laughs> so that's what it's like being a novelist. They, they build you up and they, they tear you down. Um, I'm going to go with the 20 minute reading so that we can have a little discussion with, between, between Tim and me and then, and then with, with you all. Um, and he, he talked, you know, you actually don't need to know about semiotics to understand this book. It's a book about college, therefore a book about sex and drugs in the main. But um, while that's going on, of course, at college you are reading books and being, being influenced by them. So, so s s there, is, um, there is certainly a, f a fair amount of semiotics, but don't get, don't get worried. Um, you don't really have to understand anything. Um, I'll just tell you, in this section, there are a couple quotes from A Lover's Discourse by Roland Barthes. And in the book, they're in italics, and it's it's rather difficult to, to read in italics. So I'll have to try to give a sense um, to you when it's Roland Barthes uh, speaking and, and when it's um, my, own, my own prose, but it, it, should be, it should make sense. This is early, early on uh, in the book, so you don't need a lot to know a lot about plot to understand it. Madeline is at college. She's falling in love with Leonard. That's all you need to know. 
It was debatable whether or not Madeline had fallen in love with Leonard the first moment she'd seen him. She hadn't even known him then, and so what she'd felt was only sexual attraction, not love. Even after they'd gone out for coffee, she couldn't say that what she was feeling was anything more than infatuation. But ever since the night when they went back to Leonard's place after watching Amarcord and started fooling around, when Madeline found that instead of being turned off by physical stuff, the way she often was with boys, instead of putting up with that or trying to overlook it, she'd spent the entire night worrying that she was turning Leonard off, worrying that her body wasn't good enough or that her breath was bad from the Caesar salad she'd unwisely ordered at dinner. Worrying, too, about having suggested they order martinis because of the way Leonard had sarcastically said, Sure, martinis. We can pretend we're Salinger characters. After having had, as a consequence of all this anxiety, pretty much no sexual pleasure, despite the perfectly respectable session they'd put together, and after Leonard, like every guy, had immediately fallen asleep, leaving her to lie awake, stroking his head, and vaguely hoping she didn't get a urinary tract infection. Madeline asked herself if the fact that she'd just spent the whole night worrying wasn't, in fact, a surefire sign that she was falling in love. And certainly, after they'd spent the next three days at Leonard's place having sex and eating pizza, after she'd relaxed enough to be able to come at least once in a while and finally to stop worrying so much about having an orgasm because her hunger for Leonard was in some way satisfied by his satisfaction. After she'd allowed herself to sit naked on his gross couch and to walk to the bathroom knowing he was staring at her imperfect ass, to root for food in his disgusting refrigerator, to read the brilliant half-page of philosophy paper sticking up out of his typewriter, and to hear him pee with taurine force into the toilet bowl. Certainly, by the end of those three days, Madeline knew she was in love. But that didn't mean she had to tell anyone, especially Leonard. Leonard Bankhead had a studio apartment on the third floor of a low-rent student building. The halls were full of bikes and junk mail. Stickers decorated the other tenants' doors, a fluorescent marijuana leaf, a silkscreen blondie. Leonard's door, however, was as blank as the apartment inside. In the middle of the room, a twin mattress lay beside a plastic milk crate supporting a reading lamp. There was no desk, no bookcase, not even a table. Only the nasty couch with a typewriter on another milk crate in front of it. There was nothing on the walls but bits of masking tape, and in one corner, a small portrait of Leonard done in pencil. The drawing showed Leonard as George Washington, wearing a tricorn hat and sheltering under a blanket at Valley Forge. The caption read, You go. I like it here. Madeline thought the handwriting looked feminine. A ficus tree endured in the corner. Leonard moved it into the sun whenever he remembered to. Madeline, taking pity on the tree, began to water it until she caught Leonard looking at her one day, his eyes narrowed with suspicion. What? she said. Nothing. Come on, what? You're watering my tree. The soil's dry. You're taking care of my tree. She stopped doing it after that. There was a tiny kitchen where Leonard brewed and reheated the gallon of coffee he drank every day. A big, greasy wok sat on the stove. The most Leonard did in the way of preparing a meal, however, was to pour grape nuts into the wok with raisins. Raisins satisfied his fruit requirement. The apartment had a message. The message said, I am an orphan. Madeline's roommates, Abby and Olivia, asked her what she and Leonard did together, and she never had an answer. They didn't do anything. She came to his apartment, and they lay down on the mattress, and Leonard asked her how she was doing, really wanting to know. What did they do? She talked, he listened, then he talked, and she listened. 
She'd never met anyone, and certainly not a guy, who was so receptive, who took everything in. She guessed that Leonard's shrink-like manner came from years of seeing shrinks himself. And though another of her rules was to never date guys who went to shrinks, Madeline began to reconsider this prohibition. Back home, she and her sister had a phrase for serious emotional talks. They called it having a heavy. If a boy approached during one, the girls would look up and give warning. We're having a heavy. And the boy would retreat until it was over, until the heavy had passed. Going out with Leonard was like having a heavy all the time. Whenever she was with him, Leonard gave her his full attention. He didn't stare into her eyes or smother her the way Billy had, but he made it clear he was available. He offered little advice, only listened and murmured reassuringly. People often fell in love with their shrinks, didn't they? That was called transference and was to be avoided. But what if you were already sleeping with your shrink? What if your shrink's couch was already a bed? And plus, it wasn't all heavy, the heavies. Leonard could be funny. He told hilarious stories in a deadpan voice. His head sank into his shoulders, his eyes filled with rue as his sentences drawled on. Did I ever tell you I play an instrument? Some of my parents got divorced. They sent me to live with my grandparents in Buffalo. The people next door were Latvian, the Breverises, and they both played the kokel. Do you know what a kokel is? It's sort of like a zither, but Latvian. Anyway, I used to hear Mr. and Mrs. Breveris playing their kokels over in the next yard. It was an amazing sound, sort of, sort of wild and overstimulated on the one hand, but melancholy on the other. The kokel is the manic depressive of the string family. I was bored to death that summer. I was 16, six foot one, 138 pounds. I used to get high in my bedroom and blow the smoke out the window, and then I'd go out to the porch and listen to the Bavarises playing next door. Sometimes, sometimes other people came over, other cocoa players. They set up lawn chairs in the backyard, and they'd all sit there together. It was an orchestra, a cocoa orchestra. Then one day they saw me watching and invited me over, and I asked Mr. Bavaris how you played a kokel, and he started giving me lessons. I used to go over there every day. They had this old kokel they let me borrow. I used to practice five, six hours a day. I was into it. At the end of that summer, when I had to leave, the Bavarises gave me the kokel to keep. I took it on the plane with me. I got a separate seat for it, like I was Rostropovich. And when I got home, I kept on practicing. I got good enough that I joined this band. We used to play at ethnic festivals and orthodox weddings. Me and all the adults, most of them were Latvian, some Russians too. Our big number was Ochichornia. That's the only thing that saved me in high school. The kokel. Do you still play? Hell no, are you kidding? The kokel? Listening to Leonard, Madeline felt impoverished by her happy childhood. She never wondered why she acted the way she did or what effect her parents had had on her personality. Being fortunate had dulled her powers of observation, whereas Leonard noticed every little thing. For instance, they spent a weekend on Cape Cod and as they were driving back, Leonard said, What do you do? Just hold it? What? You just hold it for two days until you get back home. As his meaning seeped in, she said, I can't believe you. You have never, ever taken a dump in my presence, Madeline. In your presence? When I am present or nearby. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with it? Nothing. If you're talking about, I sleep over and go off to class the next morning, and then you go and take a dump, that's understandable. 
But when we spend two, almost three days together, eating surf and turf, and you do not take a dump the entire time, I can only conclude that you are more than a little anal. <laughs> so what? It's embarrassing, Madeline said. Okay, I find it embarrassing. Leonard stared at her without expression and said, Do you mind when I take a dump? Do we have to talk about this? It's gross. I think we do need to talk about it. Because you're obviously not very relaxed around me. And I am, or thought I was, your boyfriend. And that means, or should mean, that I'm the person you're most relaxed around. Leonard equals maximum relaxation. Guys weren't supposed to be the talkers. Guys weren't supposed to get you to open up. But this guy was. This guy did. He'd said he was her boyfriend, too. He'd made it official. I'll try to be more relaxed, Madeline said, if it'll make you happy. But in terms of excretion, don't get your hopes up. <laughs> this isn't for me, Leonard said. This is for Mr. Lower Intestine. This is for Mr. Duodenum. Even though this kind of amateur therapy didn't exactly work, after that last conversation, for instance, Madeline had more, not less, trouble going number two if Leonard was within a mile. It affected Madeline deeply. Leonard was examining her closely. She felt handled in the right way, like something precious or immensely fascinating. It made her happy to think about how much he thought about her. By the end of April, Madeline and Leonard had gotten into a routine of spending every single night together. On weeknights, after Madeline finished studying, she headed over to the biology lab, where she'd find Leonard staring at slides with two Chinese grad students. After she finally got Leonard to leave the lab, Madeline then had to cajole him into sleeping at her place. At first, Leonard had liked staying at the Narragansett. He liked the ornate moldings and the view from her bedroom. He charmed Olivia and Abby by making pancakes on Sunday mornings. But soon, Leonard began to complain that they always stayed at Madeline's place and that he never got to wake up in his own bed. Staying at Leonard's place, however, required Madeline to bring a fresh set of clothes each night. And since he didn't like her to leave clothes at his place, and to be honest, she didn't like to either because whatever she left picked up a fusty smell, Madeline had to carry her dirty clothes around to classes all day. She much preferred sleeping at her own apartment, where she could use her own shampoo, conditioner, and loofah, and where it was clean sheet day every Wednesday. Leonard never changed his sheets. They were a disturbing gray color. Dust balls clung to the edges of the mattress. One morning, Madeline was horrified to see a calligraphic smear of blood that had leaked from her three weeks earlier, a stain she'd attacked with a kitchen sponge while Leonard was sleeping. You never wash your sheets, she complained. I wash them, Leonard said evenly. How often? When they get dirty. They're always dirty. Not everyone can drop off their laundry at the cleaners every week, Madeline. Not everybody grew up with clean sheet day. You don't have to drop them off, Madeline said, undeterred. You've got a washer in the basement. I use it too, Leonard said, just not every Wednesday. I don't equate dirt with death and decay. Oh, and I do? I'm obsessed with death because I wash my sheets? People's attitudes to cleanliness have a lot to do with their fear of death. This isn't about death, Leonard. This is about crumbs in the bed. This is about the fact that your pillow smells like a liverwurst sandwich. Wrong. It does. Wrong. Smell it, Leonard. It's salami. I don't like liverwurst. <laughs> to, uh, to a certain extent, this kind of arguing was fun. But then came nights when Madeline forgot to pack a change of clothes and Leonard accused her of doing this on purpose in order to force him to sleep at her place. Next, more worryingly, came nights when Leonard said he was going home to study and would see her tomorrow. He began pulling all-nighters. One of his philosophy professors offered Leonard the use of his cabin in the Berkshires, and for an entire rainy weekend, Leonard went up there alone to write a paper on Fichte, returning with a typescript 123 pages long and wearing a bright orange hunter's vest. The vest became his favorite item of clothing. He wore it all the time. 
He started finishing Madeline's sentences, as if her mind was too slow, as if he couldn't wait for her to gather her thoughts. He riffed on the things she said, going off on strange tangents, making puns. Whenever she told him he needed to get some sleep, he got angry and didn't call her for days. And it was during this period that Madeline fully understood how the lover's discourse was of an extreme solitude. The solitude was extreme because it wasn't physical. It was extreme because you felt it while in the company of the person you loved. It was extreme because it was in your head, that most solitary of places. The more Leonard pulled away, the more anxious Madeline became. The more desperate she became, the more Leonard pulled away. She told herself to act cool. She went to the library to work on her marriage plot thesis, but the sex fantasy atmosphere, the reading room eye contact, the beckoning stacks, made her desperate to see Leonard. And so, against her will, her feet began leading her back across campus through the darkness to the biology department. Up to the last moment, Madeline had the crazy hope that this expression of weakness might in fact be strength. It was a brilliant strategy because it lacked all strategy. It involved no games, only sincerity. Seeing such sincerity, how could Leonard fail to respond? She was almost happy as she came up behind the lab table and tapped Leonard on the shoulder, and her happiness lasted until he turned around with a look not of love, but annoyance. It didn't help that it was spring. Every day, people seemed more and more unclothed. The magnolia trees budding on the green looked positively inflamed. They sent out a perfume that drifted through the windows of Semiotics 211. The magnolia trees hadn't read Roland Bart. They didn't think love was a mental state. The magnolias insisted it was natural, perennial. On a beautiful warm May day, Madeline showered, shaved her legs and washed and shaved her legs with extra care and put on her first spring dress, an apple green baby doll dress with a bib collar and a high hem. Her bare legs, toned from a winter of squash playing, were pale but smooth. She kept her glasses on, left her hair loose, and walked over to Leonard's apartment on Planet Street. On the way, she stopped at a market to buy a hunk of cheese, some stoned wheat thins, and a bottle of Valpolicella. Coming down the hill from Benefit towards South Main, she felt the warm breeze between her thighs. The front door of Leonard's building was propped open with a brick, so she went up to her apartment and knocked. Leonard opened the door. He looked like he'd been napping. Nice dress, he said. They never made it to the park. They picnicked on each other. As Leonard pulled her toward the mattress, Madeline dropped her packages, hoping the wine bottle didn't break. She slipped her dress over her head. Soon, they were naked, raiding, it felt like, a huge basket of goodies. Madeline lay on her stomach, her side, her back, nibbling all the treats. The nice-smelling fruit candies, the meaty drumsticks, as well as more sophisticated offerings, the biscotti flavored with anise, the wrinkly truffles, the salty spoonfuls of olive tapenade. She'd never been so busy in her life. At the same time, she felt strangely displaced, not quite her usual tidy ego, but merged with Leonard into a great, big, protoplasmic, ecstatic thing. She thought she'd been in love before. She knew she'd had sex before. But all those torrid adolescent gropings, all those awkward backseat romps, the meaningful, performative summer nights with her high school boyfriend, Jim McManus, even the tender sessions with Billy, where he insisted they look into each other's eyes as they came, none of that prepared her for the wallop, the all-consuming pleasure of this. Leonard was kissing her. When she could bear no more, Madeline grabbed him savagely by his ears. She pulled Leonard's head away and held it still to show him the evidence of how she felt. She was crying now. In a hoarse voice edged with something else, a sense of peril, Madeline said, I love you. 
Leonard stared back at her. His eyebrows twitched. Suddenly, he rolled sideways off the mattress. He stood up and walked across the room. Crouching, he reached into her bag and pulled out a lover's discourse from the pocket where she always kept it. He flipped the pages until he found the one he wanted. Then he returned to the bed and handed the book to her. I love you, je t'aime. I love you. As she read these words, Madeline was flooded with happiness. She glanced up at Leonard, smiling. With his finger, he motioned for her to keep going. The figure refers not to the declaration of love, to the avowal, but to the repeated utterance of the love cry. Suddenly, Madeline's happiness diminished, usurped by the feeling of peril. She wished she weren't naked. She narrowed her shoulders and covered herself with the bedsheet as she obediently read on. Once the first avowal has been made, I love you has no meaning whatever. Leonard, squatting, had a smirk on his face. It was then that Madeline threw the book at his head. Thank you. I apologize, my jet lag um, caused me to not read the first quote of Roland Bart, which was about ex extreme solitude. So when you finally get to the point where Madeline realizes what extreme solitude means, that the lover's discourse is of an extreme solitude, you had no way of um, knowing that. But I just wanted to clear, <laughs> clear that up. Thank you. Great to hear the writer read his, uh, his book. I'm also grateful for um, Quoting in your book, taking a dump in each other's presence, picnicking on each other. My 14-year-old son is in the audience. I'm sure he'll conclude tonight, literature ain't that. That was for Sander. That, that was, was for Sander, yes. yes. I love you, you said in a very soft voice. Um, when was the last time you said to somebody, I love you? This is the Oprah Winfrey show, is it? <laughs> Um, in a soft voice or just in general? I said it to my daughter on the phone this morning uh, in a truncated fashion. Love you without the I, um, which just seems how it is on the phone often. You remember when you said it for the first time where you really meant it? First time in my life? Romantically. <laughs> not, like to my, not like to my beagle or something? No. Well, where you remember, I really mean what I say. In light of what you've finished reading, that particular uh, part. I, I, I'm, I'm sure I said it to, to my first girlfriend in high school and then probably my first major girlfriend in college. I remember it being a dramatic moment. Um, and that actually, you know, it, there, it, there is a section in, in Lover's Discourse that talks about, about that and I j just read that and I, I remember um, people, dis people discussing that in a kind of intellectual fashion um, at college, I mean, the whole, f the funny thing about uh, the book A Lover's Discourse is that it purports to be a kind of manual um, to protect yourself or inoculate yourself against the illusion of romantic love. It's, it, it, you look at all the aspects of love and, and Bart has, has, you know, taken them all apart and you should get a grip on, um, on what this is, this, this in, in his opinion, uh, an emotion that's kind of created by the literature about love that then tells us, teaches us, that or forces us to expect we will also fall in love with, with our soulmate and, and, um, and, and so on. But the, when you read A Lover's Discourse, the odd thing is that you actually get put into quite a romantic mood because that it's full of quotes from great romantic novels and th there's a lovely, lush um, writing by Bart about his own romantic struggles and, and pains and agonies. So, um, you read it trying to be very intellectual and cold and philosophical, but you actually get rather mushy um, in reading it. And um, that's, in a sense, what this book is about, is about too, is about a young woman trying to emancipate herself from romantic illusions at the same time as she's falling in love um, thunderously. I've gotten a few letters from people um, since the book came out, including actual semiotic professors, people who understand 
understand it, unlike you and me. Um, and the same thing happened, you know, one of the stories was that this, this woman who's now a professor was reading a lover's discourse in graduate school and actually sent bits of it to her boyfriend at the time. It became a, a, a way of having love notes between them, even though the book is, you know, purportedly not, not supposed to help you with that. Because it's funny, you end where you read, I didn't know what you were going to read, and I had it printed out as the first thing that I wanted to quote, that particular part from the book. And I'm just going to repeat it anyway. Je t'aime, I love you, refers not to the declaration of love, to your vowel, but to the repeated utterance of the love cry. Once the first avowal has been made, I love you has no meaning, whatever. What, where does, what, what makes this book in that light? A, a typical love story. Well, I mean, that, that's certainly not, I don't, I don't agree with that, that statement of, of Bart's at all, I have to say. Um, it seems like saying it um, many times, it still has, has force to it. So I actually don't even understand, um, it's a rather quizzical statement. You don't, um, you don't understand? I don't understand why once it's been said it has no meaning. No, I don't understand that line at all. Um, well, that's why I asked you, like, what you remember what the first time you said it, you said it. So was yeah. it just well, I don't know, I know. important for you when you said it for the second time? There actually, there is a YouTube um, video of oh, me cool. saying I love you for my first time. It's, <laughs> it's also very riveting. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, I, I, the question is, how is this a love story? This is a, well, this book began with the sentence um, on page 19, and it goes... Madeline's love troubles had begun at the time when the French theory she was reading deconstructed the very notion of love. So it's a, it's a love story about someone who's becoming self-conscious about love um, and, and, and yet who's certainly not um, able to not be ensnared by, by the emotions that, that you know, everyone is, is ensnared by sooner or later. Where does she come to realize that, that what she's been reading is not really what's happening to her with Leonard? Well, she, Madeline comes to the study of semiotics, and this is sounding like the book is entirely about semiotics, which it isn't. <laughs> um, but she's, she's reading 19th century novels about, you know, with marriage plots, Jane Austen and the, the books that you referenced in your, in your introduction. And she, at, a, at a certain point, she realizes how old-fashioned those novels are, and all the cool kids are taking semiotics, especially at Brown in the, in, in the late 70s and early 80s. So she wants to have more rigor in her literary studies, and she wants to see what all the fuss is about, about semiotics. And she gets into this course. She doesn't have a very easy time in the course. She doesn't really agree um, with, with certain of the... the, the bent of nihilism that, that some of the philosophers uh, express. Um, and, she, you know, she remains the same person she was when she, when, when she went in. The only book that she can have any kind of purchase on is, is A Lover's Discourse. But I, I don't know really how to answer your, your question in terms of how does she know it's differing. Um, you know, the, this book is really about her falling in love with Leonard. Um, and she just happens to be in a course where they're reading this material at the same time. Um, she, she falls in love with Leonard... For, for a number of reasons and, and, and resists it at first, but I don't... Um. Why did you practice the voice for, um, for Leonard here? Uh, was this the depressed voice? Did you practice this? No, when you write, when you, write you um, have a voice in your head of, uh, of the character and, and um, sometimes it won't be exactly right. You'll, you'll say it out loud. It doesn't seem to, to be right. Um, and so you, you modulate the dialogue or the... Or the in that case, the soliloquy, um, in, or, in order to, to, for the character to, to form with clarity in, in your head. So I guess you practice it in a sense, yes. But because at this point in the book, he is not the depressive person he becomes later on in the book. Well, if uh, a, a reader of this book doesn't know anything about his mental illness to, to, to tell quite a long, long ways, it's, it's difficult because obviously the reviews mention that he's manic depressive, but a, lot, you know, a fair amount of the surprise of the first 120 pages um, come from not knowing, not understanding his symptoms. In, this, in the section I just read, the fact that he's wearing a, a, a vest, a hunter's vest, the fact that he starts making puns on the things she says and staying up all night, these are all early signs of, of, of approaching mania. But, but Madeline has no uh, way of interpreting them at, at that time. I was very struck by, at some point later on in the book, when he really is depressed and he's telling Madeline after they got married, 
and are about to move to New York when they're living with her parents at some point, where he really, maybe I should ask you to, to read that. Because this is the part where he says, in a doctorly mode, um, let me tell you what happens when a person's clinically depressed, Leonard began in his infuriatingly doctorly mode. What happens is that the brain sends out a signal that it's dying. The depressed brain sends out this signal and the body receives it. And after a while, the body thinks it's dying too. And then it begins to shut down. That's why depression hurts, Madeline. That's why it's physically painful. The brain thinks it's dying, and so the body thinks it's dying. And then the brain registers this, and they go back and forth like that in a feedback loop. Is this the voice that you had in mind when you wrote this? An infuriating Leonard? Is that the voice I had in mind? when I Or for him? Because you well, come really close to a manic depressive person. My father was manic depressive and it was really an eye opener to see that that's actually what somebody is going through. How did you get to clo so close to somebody who's suffering from that? I just had to uh, imagine it really like I do any of my, my characters. What I do mainly in writing characters is I work kind of in a, um, like a method actor would, would work. Instead of being from the outside and finding a person and describing that person, as, in a way as a, as a journalist would. Um, I try to put myself into the person's body and imagine what it would feel like to be that person. I did that with Middlesex, with you know, my intersex narrator. I had to imagine that I had been born with a genetic condition. Um, and you, you just kind of play the part as an actor would. Um, but in, how can in a you sense. imagine a manic depressive? Well, you can imagine anything. I mean, being a novelist is, mainly just using your imagination. I did a fair amount of research into manic depression to find out what were the symptoms associated with it. Um, I think we know a lot about depression because depression's been written about quite a bit, but mania hasn't been written about so much. Um, and the interesting thing about manic depression or bipolar as it's called now, is that it's the only mental illness that has an upside to it because it, in, the, in the low form of mania, you know, people feel ecstatic and they, they can, achieve incredible feats of intellectual prowess and he's sometimes athletic. Um, and they, they, they remember those periods as some of the best of, in their lives. But then of course it kind of overheats and, and they, they get fairly, fairly insane. So, um, you know, I, Leonard began just as an idea of a boyfriend for, Mitch, for, for Madeline. This boyfriend who would be both the best and the worst boyfriend in the world, but in one, but in one person. And that appealed to me dramatically. Um, but I didn't know what he was going to be like. I didn't really know that much about manic depression um, until I, I read a, a bit about it. But then at, at a certain point, you just have to plunge into the, pers the character and try to imagine what it would be like. Um, and there's, there's no way for me to, to explain how, how I would do that. Um, but it's, Was there a uh, moment while you're writing the book that you thought like, hey, this person is actually not gonna be going this way, but actually we're gonna make him into a manic depressive? No, I always knew he was. I always knew he was manic depressive from the from the beginning, but I didn't know he would be such a main character. I didn't know I would narrate um, one long section of the book from from him. At first, I thought he might just be seen from the outside, but I, I gained um, increasing sympathy for him uh, as a character, and um, and you know, so the, so I, I actually made him pretty integral to to the story. But I didn't know that at first. Where did you start with this book? with that line that I quoted, just, just the idea of a young woman in a class, um, you know, tr trying to be not a, not a dunce about love, who, who's falling in love. Um, there was that irony that started, started the book, started the whole idea of, of writing a, about college, writing about the 80s, talking heads music, all, all of that came at once. You know. Because the, your book starts by describing um, um, Madeline, um, where you describe to start with, look at all the books. There were Edith Wharton novels arranged not by title, but date of publication. There was a complete modern library set of Henry James, a lot of Dickens, along with good helpings of Austen, George Eliot, and the redoubtable Bronte sisters. It, was it you in the 80s? Because you studied at Brown. And you no, Ma Madeline, that, that's not me. I mean, the, the foundational plot of the English novel is, is the marriage plot. This novel about a young woman finding a husband and, and that search really being 
consummate to, to her whole fate. Like if she gets the right one, she's going to be happy, she's going to have an inheritance. And those, th those novels are, you know, the, the fundamental novels. But you can't write them anymore as a contemporary novelist because the conditions of society and especially of women have changed so much. So I was kind of lamenting the fact that one of the great um, plots of the novel was no longer available to me. And I just began wondering, how could you write a, a marriage plot that would be true today, you know, and I consider the 1980s today, more or less, um, you know, despite the, f the fact that there's no in internet. Um, you know, you, if you look at the old novels, um, Anna Karenina, for instance, she gets divorced from Karenin, and she's ostracized by society. She's forbidden contact with her son. She goes off with her lover, Vronsky. They live in Baden-Baden. Um, and little by little, because they don't have any friends anymore, he becomes cold to her and starts losing his love for Anna Karenina. She's, she's lost her husband, she's lost her son, she's lost her lover, and finally she commits suicide just because of the difficulties of, of marriage. You can't write that book now because today uh, uh, Anna Karenina from Amsterdam would, um, would get divorced and she would move to you know, Costa del Sol in, in, in Spain and she would live fine on, on her pension or some, something like that. It, would be, it would, wouldn't be a novel. It, it would have, so what, how does it function now? Is it completely done, this marriage plot, or not? Uh, it seems to me that people are still getting married. Everyone's still falling in love. Somehow, um, the energies of, of love and marriage are still at work. And so I, as I began working on this book, I discovered that the marriage plot doesn't exist anymore in, 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 in our lives, you know, as a... As a, as a template for how we're going to live our lives, but it operates still in our heads because we've read these books, we've seen the movies that are based on these books, and we still do, um, you know, uh, imagine this this kind of final consummation of, of love, and that has real consequences in our lives, and it certainly has real consequences in the lives of these characters. What kind of writer would you have been if you had lived in that time? Do you ever consider that? In Jane Austen's time? Mm -hmm. um, let's see. I would have been... Um, Considering that I come from Asia Minor, I would probably have been picking currants to feed my silkworms. <laughs> I think I would have been a silk farmer like my, gran like my grandfather. When so, did you realize you were a writer? Um, well, I decided to be a writer at a pretty early age, about 16 years old. Um, and I went to Brown, and I went to Brown with the, with the desire, you know, I'm going to be a writer, I have to study this and this in order to become a writer, and I want to work with... Um, John Hawkes, who was on the faculty. So I, I did it pretty um, methodically, um, as though it was a profession like any others. It could have been dent dentistry that I was studying, but it just happened to be novel writing. A writer's plot. When you were 16, what was it that, you, that made you realize, like, I want to be a writer? Then? I liked doing it. I think um, that was a big part of it. I seemed to have an ability to do it, and I read a portrait of a, the artist as a young man by James Joyce, where I, um, you know, I kind of misread that book, and I, 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 took, I fell for it hook, line, and sinker, and I thought this, uh, this figure of Stephen Dedalus, who becomes a novelist, he seemed so heroic to me at the age of 16 that I decided I wanted to, I wanted to be like him. So um, that's how it started. It's how, just, how old were you then when the Virgin Suicides came out? I was in my, I was 33. So that's took you more than half of your life to actually come up with that book. Um, yes, that's, that's true, but of course you're not thinking about writing your first novel when you decide to be a writer. I mean, Virginia Woolf said um, that no one should ever publish a novel before they're 30, and that always seemed like good advice to because? me. Because? Because you don't have the ability to do it very, very well, because you're, you're in an apprentice-like stage, most people, not all. Um, where a lot of the work you're going to do is going to be unor unoriginal, and um, most of the books you write at that time are probably forgettable, um, and maybe you should should, should not um, unleash them on, <laughs> on anyone. But was see, I mean, I was, I was always happy to work on my writing and to try to get better. I was never eager to publish quickly, um, so it didn't bother me spending my 20s in, in that kind of uh, period of just trying different ways of writing and um, seeing if that? I could Was it a sort of shyness or, or I mean, isn't that what you want to do if you decide you want to be a writer, you go to Brown, you go to Stanford to do Korean yeah. writing, you want to publish, I would think. No, I wanted to be a writer. I didn't want to be a published writer. Um, 
I just wanted to Could do it. Could you elaborate on that? <laughs> well, I mean, I was just interested in it, and I was I still am very, you know, the, the major, I spend most of my life writing things that people do not see. Um, I've, pu I've finished novels that I haven't published because I didn't think they were worth anyone's time, and there's hundreds of pages of this book that I didn't include in the final version. Seriously. So a lot of writing is writing unpublished material, even if you're a published a published writer. I mean, I'm, I'm not alone in that. I think um, th there comes a, a you know a lot of the work that you you do is not um, what you want to show anybody, especially when you're young. But I just was in no I was in no rush um, until I hit about thirty, and then people started to say, well, what 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 do you do? You go to a party? What do you do? I'm a writer. Have you published anything? No, I haven't published anything. And that started to become extremely uncomfortable <laughs> around 30. In your 20s, it's okay, because everyone, you know, doesn't really know what they're doing. So, but then it's, so then I thought, okay, I do have to publish anything just to shut these people up at the cocktail party. Uh, it's, I it's just, I thought, that's why I find it a little too easy. What, what is true. it that, that actually then made you decide that you would actually publish the, the Virgin Suicides? How many versions are there of that, or how many novels did you have before that you didn't want to publish? Or have well, I, I, I got my first story published when I was 28 years old in a literary magazine. I went to graduate school, and I was 24, and most of the people in the program were in their 30s. They were all publishing or trying to get published. So the first time I thought about publishing, I was probably about 25, and it was because my other classmates seemed so keen on it. It really hadn't occurred to me um, to send something out and to get this validation of, of that at that point. Um, I guess I knew I wasn't ready, or I still had a lot to learn, I think. And, I, I, um, and then finally, I started sending things out. And I would say I got rejected for three years until finally, at 28, I got a story published. And then the second thing I got published was the first chapter of The Virgin Suicides. And I was 30 years old then. And then I finished that, that book a couple years later and, and, and published it. And then since then, um, you know, things have, things have been different. But I, I was fired from my job. Um, for writing the Virgin Suicides at work. What do you mean? Um, what happened? I mean, the real reason I what published. What kind of job did you The have? real reason that I published is because I was un unemployed and I was running out of money. So I finally did have to publish a book. But you were and, fired because of that? Yeah, because I would type it. I would type the book every day. Um, you have to keep it in your head. So I would, I would type letters to these famous American poets. That was my job. And then when no one was looking, I would write a page or two of my novel. So, you were writing letters to famous Yeah, American like John poets? Ashbery or so what I kind would of say, letters? Dear Mr. Ashbery, um, I'm writing to invite you to appear in the reading series this year at the Academy of American Poets. She went into the room. The light was low. <laughs> but, you know, then, I would, then I would type the rest of my novel, and then I would take that home at night, and I would have a, I would have a page of my novel done that I got done during the day because I had to work nine to five. So... I finally got caught doing this one too many times, <laughs> and they pulled, a, they pulled a plug on me. So I then got unemployment for six months, and that's when I finished The Virgin Suicides. It's funny that you mentioned that, running letters, because I read somewhere in an interview where you said, like, what I try to teach my students, um, the best way to write a story is to imagine that you actually write the really important letter to somebody else, that that's the way yeah, I, you should I, think. I, I tell my write. students, when you're writing, you should think that you're writing the best letter you ever wrote to the smartest friend that you have. Um, because I think that's the right attitude. If you, if you think that you're writing to a friend, there will be a kind of intimacy and a shorthand that you'll gain right away. You won't over-explain things, because your friend gets it, basically, understands what's going on. Um, but you, it also has to be the best letter you ever wrote, like a, a letter where you're almost performing to your friends. So you're not being sloppy. Um, you're, you're writing the best thing that, that you ever wrote. And it, it just helps, I think, in general um, to assume that kind of level of friendship, intimacy, and intelligence on the part of, part of the reader. How long did it actually take you to write this book, The Marriage Plot? This took about five, five years. Five years of doing what? Um, I don't mean that. Well, I was writing another book beforehand, before yeah. this, for three years, and these characters came out of that book, and I had to, yeah. I had to throw away that book. Um, but I, I saved these three people from the Titanic of that book and, um, and gave them another book. So um, what, what, what is it like? I mean, you go into your office in the morning and you start writing a, where, you, where you left off. And uh, it's like the, um, 
E.I. Lonoff character in The Ghost Rider by, by Philip Roth when he finally says, he says, I turn sentences around. I write one sentence and I turn it around. Then I write another sentence and I turn that around. Then I break for lunch. Then I come back and I throw out all the sentences and I start again. It's a little bit like that, actually. I'm trying to imagine that because you would think like, okay, if you just do like 2,000 words a day and then you should be happy and look at it later on. But you do actually every sentence you look at it and you turn it around. When I get going, I go 800 words a day when I'm, when I'm moving quickly and I, tr I try to do that. So um, that's a little bit less Lonoffian than, than uh, the description. But in my earlier books, I was more that way, very, writing very slowly and, and um, kind of inching forward. Now I've, I've gotten a little bit, little bit breezier. My, and my problem now is I, th I, I will write 800 words, but I might, I might throw those 800 words a away if they're not the right the right ones. There's um, um, one part in the book, Mitchell going to India, mm -hmm. the gap year after he graduates from Brown, and he goes to India to, uh, to help out with uh, Mother, Mother Teresa to, to, to help the dying people there, which is based on what you did in that year. There's this, just a little part um, where Mitchell at some point uh, has been there for a couple of weeks and then he just can't do it anymore because somebody is, is, is dying and he's shitting himself and needs to clean him up. And there Mitchell says, uh, Mitchell um, begins, began to move, already knowing that he would regret this moment for a long time, maybe for the rest of his life, and yet unable to resist the sweet impulse that ran through his every nerve. Mitchell headed to the front of the home and up the steps to the bright, fallen world above. Is that, is that what happened to you right there? Um, well, that's pretty close to um, how I ended up at Mother Teresa's. Like, that's the most, I mean, nothing is autobiographical because it's impossible actually to, to write the truth of your life even if you tried to do so. What's that? What do you mean? Because as soon as you begin to write about your life, you begin to invent things, and you leave you necessarily leave out other things. So it doesn't. It, it's never a, a true record of, of your life. It becomes it becomes artifice. It, be, it becomes at least artful when you begin writing about your life. Um, because you hesitate to to write about yourself, you don't want people to know. No, I mean no. I'm saying even someone who says that I only write autobiographical fiction, I don't I don't believe them. I mean they they. Um, they think they recall what, what was said when they were nine and their mother said this to them, but they, they can't possibly do that. So there's a, a level of invention even in what is supposed purportedly, you know, fidelity to the truth. But that's a separate issue. Um, with this, I did volunteer at Mother Teresa's and um, st struggled with the difficulty of some of the tasks, pushed myself through my squeamishness to do some unpleasant things. Um, but you know the the weight of that started to started to be very very heavy. Um, the idea that I was going to stay there for months and months doing it, um, and I did have a moment finally where where I left with that kind of terrible feeling of guilt and incredible ecstasy at the freedom of not having to do it anymore. Um, so it's it was a very complicated um, you know resolution, and I, I gave it I gave it to Mitchell because he goes through a similar. A similar and one of the rare occurrences in your life where actually you write that down in a book. What, was, that, was that hard to do? Or? Well, see, that this, this is the thing. is that There's bits you draw on your life to, to create a novel, but you have to leave lots of parts of your life out, and you have to change many things in your life in order to make the novel. So though that moment might be fairly true to my life, um, that section of Mitchell's, which is about 40 pages in the book, at one point it was 120 pages because I was writing really everything that I remembered about India. Um, there wasn't a beggar that I saw or a japati that I ate that was not deserving of some special mention in this, in this long section. Um, and it was no longer, uh, no, it, was, it just became a real messy chapter that wasn't working dramatically. Certain things dramatically have to happen in that chapter for the novel as a whole. So is it easier to, to imagine, to make up things in that case then? You just have to find what you need for, for your fiction. And then if that is not what happened in your life or, or you change what happened in your life, that's fine. You, you, want the, you want the piece that's going to be the right dramatic piece of, 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 of action in the book. And it's harder when you write close to your own life because your, your fictive, your imagination 
competes with your memory. Um, when you write about your own life, everything seems of equal value. But when you, when you create a character out of your imagination, you, you know actually what's, what's more important in terms of the story of that character. That's why I try not to hew too closely to my own, um, own, own life. At the same time, though, you can't write unless you have a connection with your material and, and with what the what characters went through. Start open to the audience. Ready? Okay. All right. I got a lot of things, but I want to, of course, give the audience uh, as soon as possible an opportunity to ask questions. There is a microphone right here, and there's a microphone up there, the gentleman over there. So, question. Paul, if you have a question, please go up to the microphone because we're recording it. By the way, this is an amazing uh, space. It's just so beautiful. It's really great. up there. Yep. <coughs> okay, right here. Let's Hello. start down here. Good okay. evening. Um, I have two questions. I'll make them short. Um, did you um, s um, deliberately choose the cocoa because it's such a great sounding word and it makes you smile immediately? like in slightly semiotic way. Um, and um, why did you go to Mother Teresa? Did you want to sort of do the worst thing you could think of to be worthy of your own freedom? Is that, a, is that comprehensible to you? Yes, it is. Um, the Kokol is innately comic sounding, um, and I, li I enjoyed that about the Kokol. I wanted him to have a, a strange instrument, so searched around for one until I came upon the Kokel. And then I had a, a friend who's Latvian who gave me information about the Kokel. Um, and then I actually saw Kokel on YouTube as well, Kokel cool. play. <laughs> Very exciting. love YouTube. You don't yeah. need to read books anymore. No, you right? don't. You know, it's really good. Um, and um, Mother Teresa question, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah I mean, you, It's, it's hard to say, I mean, if you want to talk, I can tell you more about Mitchell than myself in a way because it's harder to, to know why I did it. I think there were a number of reasons. I was interested, I was not brought up religiously at all. And so when I got to college, I became aware of a vast ignorance about the subject of religion. And I, th I thought I needed to know it just to understand history and also to understand literature. So I began taking religious studies courses and I found um, them much more interesting and fascinating than I expected, and I found a current of kind of high um, intellectual Catholic thought that appealed to me. So I began reading um, a, a lot of Thomas Merton and then Meister Eckhart and some of the, the famous mystics, um, and became, you know, I don't know, um, I guess you could call me religious or going through a religious stage at a young period of, of my life. But it, it also occurred to me that it couldn't remain just an intellectual pursuit if it had any validity, and that I would have to test myself against actual actions. Um, and what better way to test yourself than to go, it seemed to me, to you know Calcutta and work with the poorest of, of, of the poor. There was a lot of self-dramatizing that went into it. The idea of going there seemed um, you know, like a, an, an adventure. Um, and I was already going to India on another trip. It, it wasn't, it, I didn't go there expressly for that reason. But I wanted to see if I could do it because I had never done anything difficult. I'd never seen anyone die. I hadn't taken care of anyone. I hadn't taken care of sick people. Um, and I w felt that I was probably, um, you know, a, a weak and selfish college student, which I turned out actually to be. But at least I, had, at least I knew a little more about myself after I went. Um, but that's, that's why I did it, in the same way Mitchell. He's, he's trying actually to see, could he be a saint? What would it be like, what would it take to be a saint? Um, and so he puts himself in the condition so he can test his, his, his saintly muscles. And how did it shape you? Um, it, it, didn't, it, didn't, it didn't shape me exactly. I mean, I realized that I was really going to be a writer just as I always had thought, and as uh, pusillanimous as that is, compared to being a saint, it seemed to be where I was headed. Um, it reconfirmed my original conception of myself, I think. Hi, um, I have more of a general question. I was wondering if you could speak about the, um, the changes in the 
publishing industry with technology, specifically with e-books, and if you think that's a good thing or a bad thing. A comp complicated issue. Um, what's going on with them is um, a little bit surprising. With my last book, um, only 3% of the sales were e-books. And now with this, this one here, 60% of them have been in e-books. So 60? 60? 60? Six zero? Six zero, six zero. Oh. Um, which is um, a, a, obviously a big change. Um, US, right? United States. United States, yeah. And it's more when books just come out. They give a lot of Kindle sales when, when they come out, or e-book sales immediately. Um, interestingly, it doesn't seem to be holding down the, the hardback sales in the United States. These are doing pretty well but it's, hurt, it's possibly hurting the paperback sales because um, people will just buy the, the e-book and then they won't buy the, the paperback. So it's unclear what's going to happen. I, had, you know, I did a tour of America and um, you, know, you couldn't help but feel anxious for all the wonderful independent booksellers who are, who are dealing with it. They seem to be doing okay actually at the moment, but um, they're, they're scared. And then there's the, the question of um, not that there's another form. I mean, there's a, there's a possibility that the ebook will be another f another format for books to be read, um, and I think no one really w thinks that that's possible to to oppose. The idea, though, that a large company will be able to have such power um, that they will be getting the content directly from from the writers and doing away with the publishers. In, you know, by, by telling the, the authors, we will pay you 50% royalty instead of 15. Um, that scares me because publishers are extremely important in wh what they do. And you know, that goes all the way from the editing to the, to the publicity. Um, and you know, what, why I'm hopeful that that's not going to happen is that it's, it's impossible actually to publish books without a publisher. And, and um, a great e-book e retailer might try to replicate that process. But if they did so, they would end up re you know, replicating publishing houses anyway. The publishing houses that they might want to destroy, they would have to rebuild in, or in order to publish books in, in, a, in a decent way. So um, I think we'll come through this with um, huge changes to the, to the, to the market, but um, I'm fairly encouraged by, by my recent touring, you know, every, since I only write a book every, every decade, I see the, I see the changes. Um, uh, you know, a lot of people with, with hardback books still, and a lot of people reading the, the paper books, um, and, and of course, a, a huge, huge new faction reading in e-books as well. So 60%, how much is the year? Primaitage, you open this month? 1% in Holland. Wow. Somebody else, over here. And you can't sign it. You can't sign an e-book reader. So people are very upset about that. But. Hi, I was Hi. wondering what you think that the appeal is to you of young female characters, and what you do to put yourself in the female perspective. Um, well, I've written about a lot of young characters. Some have been female. Some have been hermaphroditic. Some have been. Um, <laughs> middle-aged men who never grow up particularly, which is the voice of the virgin suicides. Um, so it's not something I'm even co conscious of, really. I mean, I just, I always knew that if, if you're going to be a novelist, the job is to write about m both men and women. So you have to know as much as you can about both sexes. And one of the appeals of having a narrator who is an intersex person in Middlesex was that that person has the kind of omniscience that a novelist dreams of, to, to really have lived as a, as a girl and as, as a boy at, at once. This is actually the first book where I've gone into a, f a female's mind um, and, re and really tried to do it, because in The Virgin Suicides, the voice is, is, is male and obsessively interested in the girls, and you get a sense of who the girls are, but not because, you, I, you know, not because you're in their thoughts. And, and with, with Middlesex, a little bit I was starting to go into female characters' heads, but this time I really tried to do it. Um, the way I do it, the way I try to do it, is that I never think that I'm writing about a woman, and I never think I'm writing about women. I just think I'm writing about one sp specific person, and this person is like, and I, and I, I just then list and, and think about what is this person like. I think about other women I've known who are like, a character like Madeline, and then I put in a lot of my own history and thoughts into, into her character. So a lot of the things that, that Madeline thinks 
would be things that I, I would think. Because I don't, I don't think you should, you should be always writing, now I'm in a female mind, so that all the thoughts are going to be somehow different than my, than my own. I just, I don't, I don't believe that. So the, the, in, in the section I read today, where she comes up with this idea that if she's honest with Leonard and she shows how much she cares about him and how needy she is, the sincerity will actually work. Well, that's a mistake that I've made many times in my own, my own relationships, you know, thinking that honesty is the best policy, you know, especially in college, and often it wasn't. Um, and so I, I, I can just take something from my life and put it into hers. Um, there are a couple of other instances. There's a section where um, she has a freshman roommate, and the roommate, the first week, goes out to buy a diaphragm from health services. And the roommate, um, you know, it says, Madeline had never shared a room with someone. She thought this other girl was a little too quick with her intimacies. She didn't want to be shown her diaphragm, which looked like an uncooked ravioli. And she certainly didn't want to feel the spermicidal jelly that the girl offered to squirt into her palm. So th th this goes on, and then finally, um, th this girl begins wearing her diaphragm on the way to parties and to football games, and she has it in all the time. And finally, they go to see Desmond Tutu, who's doing an anti-apartheid rally, and Madeline says to her roommate, well, did you put your diaphragm in? And so they have a fight, and they never, they don't speak for the rest of the year. So all of that, obviously, is not male experience. But, <laughs> but I, and apparently no one even remembers what a diaphragm is, I learned on the story. But, um, I had a roommate, that I, and we had a fight, and I didn't speak to him for the rest of the year. We lived in this tiny room, and we didn't speak. So I used that, that little bit of my life and then transmute it with, with the other experience, and then you come out with something. And that's how I will write a, a female character. Um, and is that something that might be coming back in future works? I'm saying this in light of the fact that you have two older brothers. Mm -hmm. Your parents really wanted to have a third child to be a girl. They even yeah. had thought of a name for that child, Michelle. Mm -hmm. Has that been playing a part for you in your writing? I don't think so. I think I, that's a true story that I was supposed to be the girl and they were going to call me Michelle. And, um, I, but I don't think it's like psychically um, deformed me and that's why I wrote Middlesex. I, <laughs> I do think, um, you know, I grew up at a time when masculinity was being redefined. We were told that we, were, we had to be sensitive now. And... Um, and that we perhaps didn't even know what it was to be a man. So when you're trying to figure out how to be a man at a time when masculinity is, is questioned, I, th I think you end up perhaps having um, at least a, a fuzzy enough s sense of, of what you're supposed to be like um, as a man that might, might allow you to write female characters. I do, th I do think a lot of the male novelists of my generation have, have done a better job of depicting female um, characters than perhaps the, the generation directly before, which was a more World War II generation where they were forged in steel. We were, we were forged in granola, so it was different. What's the hardest thing to write from a female perspective then? The hardest? Mm -hmm. um, as I said, it's not, I, I just don't think of it as a female. It would be hard to write about a woman that I knew nothing about or was nothing like. Um, that would be harder. But, you know, Madeline is, is not so different from me. So I just never think I'm writing in a female perspective, just writing about a person. I mean, people are so different from, from one another that, that, you know, to have a kind of category over everyone's head doesn't really help when you're writing uh, literary characters. Um, yeah, my uh, wife and I sort of uh, take turns reading your books and read them one after each other. And then over the years, and also just recently with Marriage Plot, we sort of reminisce about a character or reminisce about a scene as if it's something from our own lives, perhaps. And I was just wondering, um, with the exception of the Virgin and Suicides, where it's not possible, but do the characters that you create that go on to live in your head, do they then go to age with you? Or at the end of the sentence, is that, is that Leonard gone? Um, yeah, they don't, they don't continue um, in my head. Once, once the book is finished, the characters are finished. Um, at, at least f for me, you know, Richard Ford will write a, a Frank Bascom novel and then come back and write another Frank Bascom novel. I haven't had that um, experience yet. Um, some people have, have wanted, you know, like a sequel to Middlesex, which I can't imagine actually. I mean, I, I have no interest in, in doing that. So for me, no, they, it stops um, and I go on to, to different, different concerns.
different but, characters. But does it change you as a writer, especially if you look at the fact that it takes quite some time to finish a book? Take Middlesex, for example. Uh, during the years, you actually uh, you had a daughter. You became a father. Does that change then the way you actually write that book? It, yeah, your 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 life changes what you what you write about and. There's a lot about pregnancy in Middlesex and about nausea, and there's scenes where the pregnant women, their um, olfactory sense becomes extremely strong, which is something I noticed in in my wife when she was pregnant. She could smell any anything, you know, miles away. She could smell something. She was like a bloodhound, hmm. and um, so I put that into the into the book. Yeah, there was a lot. That whole book is very much about, you know, babies and the anxiety of birth, and I was certainly going through that that in my life. At the same time, sleep deprivation. Yeah, that too. Yeah, I think my question was related to the last question, to the last discussion. If you know, it's clear that you take uh, rewrite every sentence many, many times. But when you now read aloud to us, do you still have the feeling you want to rewrite it, or it's really finished for now? No, you you always want to still um, monkey with things. If you could have actually seen the pages I was reading, there were little cuts here, here, and there. Most writers feel that way. That's why they often don't want to look back at, at, at their work. You know, I mean, not always in novel writing are you, are you working in this Flaubertian method of really painstakingly slowly. Sometimes you, you do need to have a kind of energy and rush in, in the writing. So I don't want to give the impression that it's, that it's all like cutting, cutting diamonds. Um, but yes, you always want to change things. But that's what you do in your next book. You, change, you write something else. And, but you read to us this ver the published version yeah. and not your best version, which you have rewritten later on. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, f I feel like it's at the point where I can, I can read it to you without blushing too, too terribly. <laughs> so, you know what Beckett said about writing? He's like, fail, fail again, f fail better. So that's, that's what you're trying to do. But what is, it, what is it like then when you're looking at three books you've published, uh, that moment where you decide, okay, this is it, the end. What, 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 specifically for this book, was it that you realized, okay, this is it, I cannot change anything anymore, or do you at some point just have to give up, like, okay, I can keep changing, yep. but I got, somebody stops you at some yeah, point? Yeah, my publisher stops me. He comes in physically and takes, takes the book away from me. The last, Seriously? The last two books, yeah, not Descri the first one. Describe how that went. Well, I was living in Berlin, and I was writing Middlesex, and my publisher, my American publisher, Jonathan Glossy, flew over to Berlin, and, um, and took the book, I mean, took it <laughs> off my desk and went away to Frankfurt with it and read it down there. And then I met him and he said, you're done. This is finished. You only have a few things to do. With this one, he read um, all of it except the last couple of chapters and said, we are publishing next fall. Finish this now. But he had been patient over, you know, many years, and then at the end, he, has, he loses all patience. And if not, so you would have still been writing this book? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Seriously? Yeah. yeah. So he takes the book, leaves, and... I thought I was going to publish it next year. I would have still been working on it this year. But he needs to exert some pressure on me at a certain, at a certain point. He's very good at knowing when, when to do that. Well, from a publisher perspective, or from the fact that he knows, like, okay, come on, Jeffrey, this is good enough, where you think, like, it could be better? Well, that's the question. You always wonder, like, what are his ulterior motives? Does he just need a book for next fall, or yes. does he think this thing is done? <laughs> it has worked. Both times he's done it, I've found that I've, I've finished the work to my satisfaction, and that, that the deadline actually helped me to, to focus my thoughts and to finally, you know, sign off on the book. You always, at a certain point, have a feel like this is as much as I can do. And you have, to, and you have that queasy feeling when you finish, because you could go on ad infinitum, you know, monkeying with, with the book, and it, it not necessarily getting, probably definitely getting worse. You know, I did, when I got the first galleys to this book, I was in Detroit, and um, I started rewriting all, of, you know, I thought it was so awful, and I got in the blackest mood about it, and then I went back to Princeton and looked at it again, and I realized everything I had changed was actually worse, and I saw so I erased it, and you know, what I'd had was, was better, and I realized I'm done. Now I'm, I'm actually, making the book worse when I work on it. So that's when you know you're done. Is that where insecurity intertwines with brilliance? I'm sorry? Is that where yeah. insecurity intertwines with brilliance, you being a brilliant writer? That's a fact. Uh, insecurity feel, feel, it feels like a better label, but thank you. <laughs> but where, is, where is the insecurity then playing such a role? To drive you nuts? Well, it does, but you have to, I mean, 
I think it's bad if writers aren't, aren't, aren't worried about the, their work, or if they're not insecure, because you have to doubt yourself to the right level that you, that you scrutinize it and try to make it better, but not too much that, that you um, choke off you know, your, your own imagination, because that, that can happen as well. It's a kind of a balance. Two more questions, one here up there. Yep. Interview with The Guardian, uh, the interviewer asked you about why you did your religious studies and you said it would uh, probably help you finding true meaning of life. I was wondering if uh, your own merits uh, does help you find this true meaning or could you comment on that? My own what? Your own marriage. Found my, found my true meaning in life? Yeah, I was wondering. Um, boy, that's a tough one. So many personal questions tonight. <laughs> yes, Jeffrey. Um, marriage and family, um, my, my father told me when I was young, you'll see, you'll want to get married someday, you'll want to have kids, and I thought, he's crazy, Why does he, what does he mean by this? Um, but w it, it is obviously, a f you know, for, for many people, it gives a fundamental meaning to your life, um, one that's tangible, one that isn't the meaning of life that Mitchell is, is searching about, but is connected to it. Um, one of the reasons I have religious, religion as a theme in this book is because um, this book reprises many traditional themes of the novel, and the 19th century novel, there are often characters struggling with, with, with religion, if there's a god or not. Um, and you can think of Tolstoy doing that a lot, like the, the character of Constantine Levin is always, you know, not believing in God, but wishing he could believe in God. And at the end of that, mov that movie, at the end of that book, um, he, when, when Kitty finally, you know, delivers their, their, their first child and the pregnancy is so difficult and he thinks she's going to die and he finally sees his, his daughter come out, um, it's, it, he has this almost uh, epiphanic moment, Levin does, where he feels for the first time he's at the source of the energy of life and the, and, and, and the universe. And it's a very religious moment. Um, and he knows it's not going to stay with him, it's going to dissipate, and he's going to go back to, to doubting God. But something about the, the process of, 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 of having children, um, I think, can, can bring you close, close to these sorts of feeling, that these, something about life has, has a meaning. So I would, I would say that I understand that in my own life from that. But that's why I, I, I dealt with religion in this book is because it's very curiously absent from contemporary novels. I think all of us still wonder why we exist and if there's a God or what, what's the best way to live. And yet many novels um, neglect to really even just describe how many of our thoughts um, flow along those lines. I'm not sure if that was an answer to the question though, but up there. Uh, two, can we do two up there and one last thing? Okay. Okay, I actually have two questions. You can choose which one you want to um, to answer. The first one, I was really uh, curious about your decision in terms of what to read in connection to the place where you are and your audience. For example, I imagine that is sort of, you know, not a very easy decision, or maybe it is, but you know, you know you're coming to Amsterdam, you know, you're speaking to yeah. certain audience, and then you decide to read this part that you're reading. And I'm, I'm just curious to know how you, you decide that. And then the second one, I was really taken, I mean, you spoke very quickly, you mentioned your, your take on, on biography and saying that you really don't, don't believe in biography or, or something about biography that sort of stuck to me and I was wondering, um, you know, what your take on it is. I, I don't know how much time we have here, so it's, uh, we'll you can either take question. one or two. <laughs> well, I, I usually don't tailor the reading to the audience too much. I mean, you have to find a reading that's early enough in the book that it doesn't give away too much and that lends itself to a, to a dramatic presentation. So um, I, often, often I, I go for something more on the light, light side that might be some humor in it. I won't read the darkest passage first as an as a introduction to the book. But usually you just try to find a, a section that just makes, makes a certain amount of sense. Um, and I don't, I don't usually change it for, for the audience. Um, but and the, 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 uh, your second question is just that um, I'm just dis distrustful of the memoir as a, as a form. I think that um, there's a, a huge element of, of fiction and, and fraudulence in memoirs. I mean, you might be able to write it about your life and be as truthful as possible, but writers should 
be upfront about what they can't remember and, and what they're inventing. And I, I think it's gotten very fuzzy and the memoir writers used to be better at that, um, at, at admitting and, and being honest about the limitations of their knowledge and recollections. And now people are, are putting in obviously novelistic created scenes and saying it, it, it really happened. So I've just, you know, we've seen, we've seen these things blow up many times in, in the past 10 years. Um, and it's, there's a reason for that. It's because people are lying, are lying who, who write them um, often. Okay, I, I'm, huh? I'm gonna ask, because Russell is looking at me here. If like, that lady was, okay, one, one question. One, and okay. one, good, good one evening. up there that I promised, that lady. And that, that's it, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, good or evening. Did you You've been asked a lot about uh, your own life. I know. It surprises I that, me I know. a little bit. I thought bit. the Dutch were like. So I just wanted to compliment you with the way you portray women and the way you read it. I, I, I like that very much, the way, your characters, the way you do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. What a good place to end. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, sir. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> that lady up there. No, no, no. You have to wait for the microphone. No, no. You have to wait for the microphone. Otherwise, we can't tape it. Can hear. The microphone I'll up there? I'll repeat it. I'll repeat the question. Okay. Here it is. Thank you. Um, I heard and saw you nine years ago at Crystal Fury, and I wonder how those two visits compare nine years ago and today. Uh, you mean the other time with the John Adams? Yeah. Um, I didn't know where I was last time. Where was I last time? Uh, um, no, the building. The building was different. How do they compare? Um, I don't know. It's always, I mean, they're exactly the same. I had a wonderful time both times. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't have I come. Mean, <laughs> I flew okay. all this way. At least this lady. This is the last question. How do you uh, explain um, Mitchell's uh, turning in loving Madeline um, in terms of first he's traveling and he's all by himself in a, uh, away from home, and then uh, he is quite the opposite. He's next to Madeline and very close to her, and then suddenly on the last page of the book. There's you don't want to give it away. No, 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 no. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Sorry. You're a spoiler. I'm just, I'm just wondering how you explain his, his sort of religious. I, I'll tell you afterwards. I'll tell you afterwards. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Now, let me, let me, let me just, let, let me just end because you were a little evasive about like, you know, the question about your marriage and stuff. And I just want to end with this, this short, short paragraph, which I found online today from the New York Times in 1995, a love story. She was beautiful, reclusive, and surprisingly knowledgeable about trucks, tractors, and other machinery. <laughs> a few weeks after their first real date meeting at the Empire State Building, she moved into his apartment, arriving with all their belongings in paper bags. They soon started talking about what it would be like to be old together. When they got married, the wedding cake was literary, a copy of one described in Madame Bovary, which Mr. Eugenides read, read aloud to Miss Yamauchi, his wife. Very romantic. Yes, this was the article about our, our, our wedding. We just had our 16th wedding anniversary, and my mother um, unearthed that and just read that over, over the phone to me two days ago. So I'm quite up on, on that. It's online. Yeah. For, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Jeffrey Eugenides, one of the greatest living American novelists, full stop. <laughs> thank you very much for a brilliant book. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your eloquence. And thank you for opening up in what was, uh, I think, a surprisingly uh, personal barrage of questions. Uh, thank you for all of it. Tim, uh, thank you, as always. I did not mean to suggest you would be an expert in semiotics, but that you, sur having survived uh, David Sedaris, you would certainly survive tonight, and you, and you did indeed. I would also like to thank uh, Prometheus Publishers for bringing Jeffrey Eugenides, the single Kerk, uh, Athenaeum Book Handel for uh, providing the books, and our sponsors, Aegon, Walters Kluwer, McKinsey, Google, Ahold, 
PWC and the U.S. Embassy in The Hague. Upcoming John Adams events. We have two back-to-back -back in January. On the 18th, Leo Blockhaus, the Dutch pop professor, with his book, Sounds of the South, about the music of the American South, and that will be coupled with music by the Dutch rock band Czech One Two. And I think the keyboard player is here somewhere. Where's, oh, there he is over there. Yes, sir. Um, and uh, the very next night, January 19th, Chad Harbach, uh, first-time novelist, The Art of Fielding, is an uh, outstanding and hugely acclaimed debut novel. Uh, please uh, come to one or both of those events. Jeffrey Eugenides will sign books right here. Thank you all very much.